I thought I'd join the services to stop terrorism. That being the kind of um, argument they'd made to me during the recruitment process. I'd obviously raised concerns, the things I'd read about MI5 in the press, and they kind of assured me those things weren't true. So now I was in a situation where I wasn't actually stopping terrorism, I was party to funding a terrorist operation. You might have heard many things about David Shaler. Spy, whistleblower, traitor, transvestite, prophet, but very few know the real man. In late 2013, I sat him down in a cell known as the tank in Highgate, London, and debriefed him on his experiences. I blew the whistle on MI6 funding Al-Qaeda in an operation in which innocent people died. I blew the whistle because I believe that a wider audience needed to know what was going on behind the scenes in the British state. I have to mention I met Dave when he was campaigning for the 9-11 Truth Movement before he had his awakening. 9-11 was used as the excuse for the so-called war on terror, a war on terrorism that has in fact been a war on freedom. The grandson of a parks gardener and steel worker and son of a construction manager and nursery school teacher, Dave spent his formative years in the northeast of England, which made him a lifelong borough fan. At the age of nine, I moved down to Beaconsfield in Buckinghamshire, the home counties, essentially. So I was there from nine to 18, went off to university, basically. Now, I was never, ever a queen and country man. In 1991, if someone had told me earlier that year that I'd worked for MI5 in my life, I'd have laughed at them. If they'd said you'd be working for MI5 by the end of this year, I would have just thought this person was insane. And yet, that's what happened. Before his recruitment into MI5, Dave went to Dundee University, where he got a degree in English. During his time there, he spent a year as editor of the student newspaper. On graduating, he got a job with the Sunday Times, but was let go after seven months. So yeah, I worked for the Sunday Times. The Sunday Times sacked me after seven months. It didn't work out. It wasn't a Why? Thing. Yeah, it wasn't. It was supposed to be a training scheme, and no one had thought it through. And it was I was looking for jobs in journalism. After that, I saw the advert saying Godot isn't coming across the top page in the uh, classified section of The Independent. It wasn't so much that it sounded like a job in journalism that interested Dave. It was the fact that he'd studied Waiting for Godot by Samuel Beckett in French and English. In the play, the eponymous Godot never turns up. But anyway, I went to the interview in this unmarked building in London. It was actually in Tottenham Court Road, just down from where I was actually working by a strange coincidence. And uh, you open the door there and there's no one working there. You get meet, met by this sort of very epitome of an intelligence officer, this old guy with swept back silver hair and short pinstripe suit, you know, very pucker type, patrician looking. It was the most mad interview and I sat down and one of the first questions he asked was about my political views when I was 12 and do I have any religious beliefs, you know, it's a bit, a bit weird, isn't it? But we get to a point uh, where we were talking about the ethics of intelligence. And so he says to me, you know, really, why do you think you're in an unmarked building in London talking about the ethics of intelligence? And of course you're thinking this is MI5, but you don't want to say that in case it's not. So the guy repeats the question, he said, well, this must be MI5. And he says, yes, and if you have to carry on the interview, you have to sign the Official Secrets Act. So as I do, you know, suddenly you think, I'm a journalist, what have I just done? Dave began a seven-month recruitment process, which involved a series of security vetting interviews with Dave's friends and two days of intelligence and leadership tests to build a psychological profile of the candidate. And I basically kind of just given people a story. <laughs> as long as it's consistent across all your referees, that's fine. And there's obviously been no mention of marijuana. Strangely enough though, just before I joined MI5, so I'd given up my previous job, it was the Friday before I was due to start, I phoned up the last of my referees to see how the interview had gone, and he said, oh, they know you smoke dope. And it was like, what? <laughs> Uh, he denied it all, he said it would never happened in front of me and that kind of stuff, but he said, yeah, no, they were asking all about it. Oh my God, so, so I was all, you know, half a mind, I think I'm going to turn up there my five, and they're just going to take me to one side and say, ha, Shayla, you thought you'd fooled us, but you haven't. <laughs> we just messed up your life, you think, oh, fuck off, kind of thing. <laughs> but I didn't, I kind of walked in that Monday morning, you know, very apprehensive, and 
that was it, and then it began. <laughs> I joined MI5 in November 1991. After a few weeks training, um, I spent a couple of weeks in the vetting section. My star designation, my MI5 number was C3P3, which is so close to C3PO, it's frightening. Um, then I moved to uh, the cancer subversion section about March 1992. In August 1992, I moved to the IRA section, uh, which was called T2A. And this had just been set up. This was MI5's new responsibility at the time. So I was part of this new team dealing with the threat from the IRA on the British mainland. And I spent two years there. I was responsible for the first MI5 intelligence-led arrest against the IRA on the British mainland that led to a conviction. It was a case of a guy called Sean McNulty. Uh, I worked in other operations against the IRA, which ultimately led to convictions. People like Phelan Hamill and uh, Hugh. Jack and Rab Friars. I want to go into now Libya, move on to Libya, Lock and then Lockerbie. Yep. It was about September, October 1994, I moved to the Libyan section. MI5 was a policy of posting people for two years. So my two years up doing the IRA, and I went off to do Libya. And my first reaction, just I really wasn't interested in the Middle East. Um, but obviously it was Libya. I knew some of the conspiracy theories about Lockerbie the attack when um, 270 people died, when a Pan Am flight was bombed out of the skies over the town of Lockerbie in 1988. Lockerbie was revenge for the bombing of Tripoli in 1986. It took the Libyans two years to plan and gather the timers and everything else and then execute the attacks. I then took over the Libyan desk in October 1994, so some six years after that. But in that time, certain conspiracy theories had developed and those were essentially that Iran was either behind the attack or an Iranian-backed group was behind the attack. So when I joined the, the Libyan section, I was able to look at all their MI5 files. It's a kind of conspiracy theorist wet dream, if you like. And I very firmly came to the conclusion that Megrahi was, uh, and certainly FEMA, his accomplice, were, uh, there was evidence beyond reasonable doubt that they were responsible for those attacks. I debunked the conspiracy theories around Lockerbie. I looked at all the evidence for myself. I went around and talked to people in the police, the special branch across the country, in the Foreign Office, in MI6, to make it very clear that the evidence was, I believed, enough to secure a conviction, which is a high standard of, of proof. Obviously, one guy was convicted, the other one was let off on a technicality. If he'd been in front of a jury, he would have been convicted. The only thing that's not clear is whether Gaddafi knew about it. There was never any evidence to implicate Gaddafi in it at all. There was evidence going up to his head of security, but not him, Gaddafi himself. So it may have been they carried it out, told Gaddafi they didn't, and then Gaddafi could honestly deny it on the world stage. I have to say, though, that the attitude of the government was very negative, the Conservative government at the time. They didn't have any interest in bringing those two guys to justice, and neither did anybody else. It seemed that they were very happy to let these conspiracy theories about Iran being involved circulate. In fact, you even see it to this day, even respectable people like John Simpson of the BBC will talk with, say there's, there's, there's evidence never been made public implicating Iran. Well, that's just simply not true. There's lots of intelligence implicating Iran, but nothing, they can never provide any detail of the attack that wasn't publicly known that could convince us they'd been involved. And that's the test. And when I was there, I thought, you know, I do have a natural talent for being able to take in large amounts of information and get the nuggets of gold. Um, that's what I've done all my life. And obviously intelligence, that's harder than in other disciplines. I say intelligence really is like doing a, a jigsaw in which you've got about 30% of the pieces and no picture on the box. A lot of it is semi-informed guessing. But some people are good at that and some people aren't. By this point I'm working in the Libyan section. I've developed uh, quite a close working relationship with MI6. Uh, my opposite number was someone known as PT-16B, called David Watson. Uh, and one day he came over to see me in the MI5 building. He wouldn't speak on the phone. This is the summer of 1995. And he said there'd been what's known as a walk-in. A walk-in is just somebody who essentially comes in to volunteer their services, unannounced, as opposed to someone you've tried to recruit. A Libyan military intelligence officer had come in and outlined a plot in which he was going to lead a group of Islamic extremists 
to assassinate Gaddafi and then take power in Libya. This had been relayed back to MI6 in London and they were very enthusiastic. And the guy checked out the, the military intelligence officer, who we think was somebody called Abdullah Abdusalam Radwan, was, we had other evidence to show, certainly within Libyan military intelligence. Radwan was actually an associate of Osman bin Laden. 